Beautiful viewers, I bid you welcome to Women on the Watch, powered by the Shapers Ark. Thank you so very much for joining us on today's episode. I am Wonola Adetayo, the Shaper. At Women on the Watch, we are very passionate about equipping you with practical principles that you can apply to enhance your personal lives as well as your relationships. We want to see you empowered and we want to see you inspired to become the best version of yourself for God's glory and for the benefit of mankind. Please consider me your friend on this journey of personal growth and relationship building. That's why we're here. I want to thank you for tuning in and being a part of this wonderful community of believers who are committed to their growth and to their well-being. Today's episode we will be looking at renewing the wine in your marriage. And the focus is on our marriages as Christians. Our feature story will be taken from the story of the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And through that story, we will extract vital lessons for the purposes of enriching our marriages. But first, let us start by taking our Bible reading. Our Bible reading is taken from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the institution called marriage. Thank you because you are the author of marriage. Father, as we study the subject of renewing the wine in our marriages. We ask, O oh God, that as the author of marriage, you will help us to wear your spectacles and to see marriage as you see it, so that, Lord, our marriages can bring glory to you and pleasure to our lives. Thank you, Abba Father, because we believe that as we have asked, we receive with a heart of thanksgiving in Jesus' name, amen. Our case study is the story of the wedding at Cana of Galilee as documented in John chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Weddings are considered important ceremonies to the Jews. They were celebrated with festivals, sometimes lasting seven days. A large number of people are usually invited and careful planning is made to ensure every guest is catered to in a hospitable manner. Jesus and his disciples were invited to this particular wedding feast in the village of Cana in Galilee. Mary, Jesus' mother, was also in attendance at this wedding. The wedding was a joyous occasion with lots of food and merriment. However, as the feast continued, the wine began to run out until it became exhausted. This was a major problem as it was considered a great shame in the Jewish culture to run out of a wine at wedding feast. It was considered a great embarrassment and an affront on the hospitality code. Mary, the mother of Jesus, noticed this and approached Jesus with a request to help. She simply said, they have no wine. At first, Jesus seemed hesitant to intervene. He told his mother, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. However, Mary was undeterred and instructed the servants to do whatever Jesus told them to do. Jesus then instructed the servants to fill six large 
stone water pots with water. Each jack would hold between 27 and 36 gallons of liquid. The servants filled the six water pots to the brim. Once this was done, Jesus told the servants to take some of the water and present to the master of the banquet, and they did so. The master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine and was amazed at the quality of the wine. While the banquet master did not know the source, the servants who drew the water knew. The banquet master called over the bridegroom and complimented him on saving the best wine for last. He said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign that Jesus gave of his ministry and the first glimpse of his glory. And his disciples believed in him. It is our earnest prayer that God will supply new wine to every marriage where the wine of joy has been exhausted. In Jesus' name, amen. A successful marriage does not happen by chance, it is built deliberately. Just as every building requires a foundation, so does every marriage. In laying the foundation for a lasting marriage, Wanawola Adatayo presents couples and intending couples with practical insights and guidance as a wise coach inspired by the Holy Spirit. The book draws on biblical principles and patterns to instruct and equip readers for a marriage that will bring glory to God while also affording the couple lasting joy and fulfillment. With inspired prayer points and practical answers to 44 frequently asked questions, laying the foundation for a lasting marriage is a treasure trove for readers at every stage of the marriage journey. Send a WhatsApp message or call 0812-402-0538 to order your copies today. Welcome back. What an interesting story of the timely intervention of God in a situation that could easily have become an embarrassment or a shame or possibly a public stigma for the couple and the family. This story offers every marriage several lessons that modern married couples can apply in order to enrich their marriages. Let us start by understanding what wine symbolizes in marriage. What does wine symbolize in marriage? Number one, in marriage, wine symbolizes the blessing of God upon that marriage. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 10. Proverbs 3 and verse 10. It says, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. We can also read Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 14, and Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 28. So wine symbolizes the presence of the blessings of God upon a marriage. That is why exhausting wine can be a very troubling issue for a marriage. Second, what does wine symbolize in a marriage? Wine symbolizes marital health. Wine in a marriage means that that marriage is healthy financially, mentally, socially, psychologically. The, 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 the marriage is healthy. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. 1 Timothy 5, 23. It says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thy often infirmity. So wine is expected to supplement health to bring health to burst forth in a marriage. What else does wine symbolize in marriage? Number three, wine symbolizes joy and merriment in marriage. Judges chapter nine and verse 13. Judges nine and verse 13. And the vine said unto them, should I leave my wine which chariot God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? 
So wine is something that cheers man, cheers God, brings merriment and joy. You can also read Psalm 104 verses 14 and 15. What else does wine symbolize in marriage? Wine symbolizes marital restoration. Marital restoration. Joel chapter 2 verses 24 and 25. Joel 2, 24 and 25. And the floors shall be full of wheat and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, the power worm, my great army, which I sent amongst you. What else does wine symbolize in marriage? Wine symbolizes intimate love. And in fact, if you read through the pages of the Songs of Solomon, you will see how many times Solomon was comparing wine with intimate love. Lastly, in marriage, wine symbolizes the presence of the blood of Jesus because it is valuable for the cleansing of the married couples from their sins. And you can read this in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Now that we understand the importance and the symbolism of wine in our marriages, symbolizing health, symbolizing the blessing of God, symbolizing joy, symbolizing intimacy between the couples, then we want to ask ourselves, what are the marriage enrichment lessons that we can learn from the story of the marriage at Cana of Galilee? There are five marriage enrichment lessons and we will attempt to go through each one of them. Number one is that Jesus must be present in your marriage. That's number one. Number two, marital exhaustion is an opportunity for God's miracle. We will go into detail later. Number three, you must, as a couple, be solution-focused and consult the right source when there is marital exhaustion. Number four, obey instructions to the letter, no matter how ridiculous it appears. And number five, present the new wine to the governor of the feast first and then continue your marital journey with confidence. Let's take each one of these lessons. The first lesson, that's lesson number one. The lesson that we're drawing for marriage enrichment from the wedding at Cana of Galilee. Number one, Jesus must be present in your marriage. The family in Cana of Galilee, they were wise. They knew that the presence of Jesus at the feast is the only guarantee of safety and the only guarantee of victory. The presence of Jesus in any marriage is a precondition for marital victory. Why? It is God that ordained marriage. It's not our own institution. It's God's institution. Therefore, wise couples will intentionally invite the presence of Jesus, not only to their individual lives, but also to their marriage. It's not the one you say, Christ is the unseen guest. No, he's not a guest. He's supposed to be the head. All right? Revelations chapter 3 and verse 20. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Christ will not get crash into any life. He will not get crash into any marriage. We must intentionally invite him just as the couple at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. You see, the presence of Jesus constitutes the third man in the marriage. And this is a major source of strength according to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12c. It says, a threefold cord is not easily broken. So the spirit of the living God, the presence with the couple is what guarantees strength in that marriage. Therefore, wise couples will make their marriage to be continually conducive for the presence of Jesus through joint prayers, through praises and word meditation. Matthew 18, 20. Matthew 18, 20. It says, for we are two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. So when the couple, husband and wife, are gathered together in the presence of God, God will come and be in their midst. Lesson number two. 
marital exhaustion is an opportunity for God's miracle. The wedding at Cana of Galilee, the couple did not go panicking. The mother of Jesus did not go panicking. They knew that this exhaustion is an opportunity to showcase the divine power of God to supply in the midst of lack. So the power of God is showcased when man comes to an end of his skill, when man comes to an end of his experience, when man comes to an end of knowledge. After Peter's skills and experience failed him, he fished all night. It was the power of Jesus that was demonstrated at that time when he said, cast your net into the deep. And he said, at thy word. So every marriage goes through rough times when the wine of, of joy seems to have finished and the couples have come to the end of their ability. You will see the husband say, I've tried my best. The wife too say, I've done everything that I can. It means you have come to your limit as human. The challenges are not meant to destroy you. They are meant as a perfect opportunity for God's timely intervention. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So when the challenges come, please don't fret. Just know, God, this is now an opportunity for you to show up. Lesson number three that we can take from the wedding at Cana of Galilee. Be focused on solution and consult the right source. You see, in the wedding at Cana of Galilee, these people, they were not looking for scapegoats. They didn't say, who drank all the wine? They didn't say, who made the calculation? Did, did somebody know that we invited 500 people? Why did they provide wine only for 200 people? There was no blame game at that marriage. They, Mary just simply told the servants, hey, whatever he tells you to do, do. Because she knew that unless you consult the right source for the solution, there will be no solution. So therefore, what should we do when problems afflict our homes? Please, we must not look for who is at fault. We must not seek to revenge. Instead, what we must be looking for, how do we bridge the gap? How do we solve the problem, because one of the attributes of love is detailed in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This attribute says love does not keep score of wrong. What you just need to do is turn to the right source of the solution. The solution may not come from the partner. The solution comes from what David says in Psalm 121 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 121 verses 1 and 2 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay? So, we, friends and families, they can also draw lessons from Mary's response to the problem. When, as friends and family members, we notice gaps in marriages of our friends, our children, we should take the matter to God rather than trying to judge the situation that we don't understand. Married couples also, don't run away from God when the problem comes. Run to him. Don't run away like Adam and Eve. They had committed blunders and they wanted to hide themselves. You can't hide from the living God. Where will you hide? Where? So run to him for a solution. So avoid turning to parents or in-laws or even unbelieving friends. Rather, please, you can seek trained and certified elders, Christian counselors and therapists for a good support, according to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, is any sick among you? So when your marriage is sick, learn to know who to turn to. Lesson number four, obey instructions to the letter. At the wedding in Cana of Galilee, there was complete obedience to the instructions given. That's why they obtained a beautiful result. When they said, pour water, they didn't say, what is this man talking about? We said we are looking for wine. You said pour water. After pouring water, I said take water. So the governor, they didn't say, oh, I, I think, Oga, oh are you sure you know what you are doing? No, 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 no. No questioning. No logic. Simple obedience. The Bible tells us, 1 Samuel 15, 22. 1 Samuel 15, 22. 
And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrificing as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So the pages of the Bible are filled with marital instructions that couples are to obey to the letter. The Bible says, wives, submit, then do it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Do it. That is what is expected. When the Bible says, treat your wife as a weaker vessel and as joint ears, please do it. When the Bible says, drink from your own cistern, please do it. Don't commit fornication. Don't commit adultery. Run away from it. When the Bible says, forgive each other, then do as he commanded. Which takes us to the last lesson, lesson number five. Present the new wine to the governor of the feast first and then continue your marital journey with confidence. At the wedding in Cana of Galilee, Jesus gave a clear instruction. He said, take the water and take it to the governor. He didn't say drink it. So before serving others, this is to teach the couples a lesson of honoring God. When our problems are solved in our families, we must learn to honor God. 1 Corinthians 1, 31b says, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So when God has solved our problem, we must return all the glory to him. We must testify of his goodness. We must continue in him and continue in his word. Most importantly, forgive your spouse, forgive yourself, and move on in your marital journey. The Bible tells us in Philippians 3, 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Don't look for scapegoats, just move on with life. Now, the natural law of deterioration is bound to affect every marriage. It will start as very exciting a marriage and then become boring and then suddenly becomes problematic and you even get to a point where you say i can't bear this anymore but this is the law of nature but wise couples will call upon god who has the power to reverse the irreversible he has the power to suspend natural protocols so if you invite him when storm is raging in your home he will steal the storm as he did for the disciples therefore we enjoin couples seek for solution and not for scapegoats. And as you do this, your marriage will begin to experience improvement. And as you obey the instruction and directions of the almighty God, I want to assure you that your testimony as a couple will be, thou hast kept the good wine until now. I want to trust that you have learned some solid principles from the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And I want to thank you for joining us on this episode. If you have found this program a blessing, we would love to hear your testimonies. Please send us an email on women on the watch testimonies at gmail.com or you can connect with us on plus 234-812-402-0538. We also look forward to partners, sponsors, mentors. I'm sure that you will be of value to all our teaming viewers. Until we meet again, this is Wanola Detayo, the Shaper, wishing you peace and blessings, especially in your marriage. Shalom.